Thank you, everybody, for attending our class on uh, growing summer vegetable, summer and winter vegetables presented by the UC Master Gardeners of El Dorado County. Our mission is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and uh, sustainable landscape practices to the community. Our class is being presented by UC Master Gardener Zach Dowell, and your hosts are Pam Lane, Ruth Hayes, and Tracy Gellio. This presentation will be about, uh, about an hour and a half long. Uh, we appreciate and encourage questions and we'll do our best to address them, uh, uh, address them all at the end of the presentation through the chat. Um, since we have quite a number of participants today, uh, we have muted everybody and turned off a video except uh, for the presenters. Uh, and one last thing, this class will be posted to our public website, uh, http colon whack whack mgldorado.ucanr.edu. Uh, we can put that in the chat and, uh, and the Facebook page after the class today, those will be posted. Okay then, let's get started. Uh, Zach Dow has been a master gardener since 2004 and has taught our popular vegetable classes for many years. I'll turn it over to Zach now. Thank you. And thank you to the Master Gardener hosts. And thanks to all of you for being here. I'm excited, as I hope you are, about getting started on spring and summer vegetables. We're right in that, in that really um, exciting, hopeful time where we're scanning, probably, if you're like me, you're scanning seed catalogs and looking at things on the web and dreaming of uh, ripe fruit and vegetables. Um, and so hopefully, this class will get you started and kind of get you on the way. So I always like to start with this question. Think to yourself, how does your garden grow? If you've grown a garden, did you grow a good garden this year? And how did it go? You can um, throw that in the chat if you want, or you can just contemplate it. And I will tell you how my garden grow, grew uh, pretty well. Summer This summer was really good. I had a um, I had some issues, and I'll talk about where my garden is, but with um, with roots taking over some of my planting boxes. And so this year, um, with an abundance of time on my hands, as many as of us have had, uh, I took the boxes, emptied them, screened out the, the roots, refreshed some of the soil, and uh, had a really good uh, spring and summer and even fall and winter harvest. So... I want you to close your, think, think, think for a minute about why, why you garden and just take just a minute. And maybe you've never asked yourself this question or maybe it's too obvious, but um, I'll give you a second. And so when we teach this class in person, a lot of answers come up. So people talk about um, and I, I'm not seeing the chat, but um, maybe you put some answers in there. People talk about, actually, I'm going to look at the chat. Did anyone put an answer in there? No. Okay. That's all right. People talk about um, fresh, freshness, right? The fact that you can plant what you like and, and eat it fresh, and it doesn't take any time um, to get from your garden to your kitchen. And people talk about um, just enjoying being outdoors and the cycles of nature. And people talk about um, gardening is therapy or meditation. So we usually have a pretty big contingent of soul gardeners and people talk about organic and, and the fact that they know exactly how the food was raised. Right. Um, and so those are all really great reasons to garden. They're some of the reasons that I garden as well. And then, uh, some people, it sometimes comes up, um, the idea that you can grow, things that are not commercially viable or they're difficult to far, find in markets. This is something I planted this year or last spring, I guess, coming up on a year. A really interesting plant, a really interesting leaf. Um, and one of the reasons that I garden is that I can grow things that uh, you sometimes just can't find in stores. So this year, I put in a whole lot of uh, unusual, what I think are largely unusual fruit trees. So Chinese haw and Cornelian cherry, which is Cornus moss, which is um, 
dogwood, right? This, uh, th where I live in Georgetown, is a good dogwood area, so I'm looking forward. Cornelian cherry is a dogwood that makes a fruit. And gumi and hardy kiwi, which are the small sort of non-fuzzy ones. Um, Japanese plums and loquat, which I don't, I'm not sure will fruit, but it certainly is an interesting tree and it seems to be surviving the cold winter just fine. And medlar and mountain ash and pawpaw, which is a fruit native to the Eastern United States and sea buckthorn and uh, an interesting plant called, uh, I don't know how to say that word, suicine or suicine mulberry, but it's actually a, uh, uh, a nettle and it creates a fruit uh, in a way that's very unusual in a cauliflorric way. So it can make fruits from its stem. Um, so that's some of the reasons that I garden. And also I like to experiment. Now mushrooms are not, um, uh, is there a muting? Can someone mute um, the extra mics? I'll work on that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so mushrooms are more related to animals than plants. Um, I like to, I don't like to eat them, but I like to grow them. We were growing them at the college, um, as a, as a, you know, they can make, you can make mycelium into things like sneakers and packing material and it's a biodegradable kind of thing. So I like to experiment in the garden. Uh, I'm working on a multi-year food forest project. This is, uh, on my property in Georgetown. This is a California native, um, plot that has Western choke cherry and, pink currants and Oregon grapes and so forth, um, integrated with the kind of plants that are already there, which are largely madrones and oaks and, and um, cedars and other things. And based on an eight layer canopy thing. So you have things going all the way from the ground and up to a climbing layer and everything in between. The idea being that you're packing a lot of food into a, 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 a small area and exploiting the kind of sunlight and shade and those kinds of things. So. People often always men uh, mention field to fork. So if you grow your own vegetables, you know that you can get them right into the, the soup pot and they don't have any, it didn't take any fossil fuels to get them from wherever they are and you're eating things that are fresh and in season. So here's a, if you've never done this, you should really try it. Go out to your garden um, and just make a meal out of what's available today to really tune into to kind of the seasonality of gardening. This would looks like to me like an early spring meal uh, because of, I know that because of the asparagus, but we have some sorrel in there, some mustards, uh, looks like some herbs of some kind. So you can make a nice salad or you could saute and uh, or stir fry that stuff. I like to grow and, and maybe you do too and lots of master gardeners do to um, share their surplus. So this is uh, if you've never, if you could ever get to the University of British Columbia Botanical Garden, uh, they have a wonderful, um, wonderful gardens there and wonderful food gardens and then they share their surplus as do we in this county through plant a row so check out that on the master gardener website i want you just for a minute to close your eyes and just imagine your garden in let's say early june or late may or on through the summer, your, your garden that you're about to plant, your spring and summer garden. Just kind of hold that image in your mind's eye. Think of all the colors, think of the smells, think of all the produce that you're going to, that's just gonna be coming off of the vine and, and all the recipes that you like to make with, with tomatoes and peppers and squash and beans. And that's the, so that's the image that, that we are hoping as master gardeners to help you achieve. This is a summer, more of a late spring, early summer, um, looks like sort of um, single meal, like go out and harvest what you can. And so here we have some tomatoes and some peppers, some shallots and garlic, sorrel again, some parsley and other herbs, Jerusalem artichokes, potatoes, and then a little bit of fruit compote with uh, grape, seedless grapes, raspberries, and blueberries. So that's why, that's why I garden. That's why, maybe why you garden as well. So today we're going to talk about we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about um, garden planning and management. There's some sort of garden cultural practices that will help you to achieve that kind of successful garden, and. Um, then we're gonna talk about the individual vegetables, what we kind of break up into spring or the earlier 
the vegetables that we're kind of planting early and that kind of get harvested before the full summer heat. And then the straight up summer vegetables, which are the things many people think of when they think of gardening, tomatoes and peppers and corn and those kind of things. We talk a little bit about perennials in this class because now's the time to be thinking about perennials that now's the time when they end up in um, nurseries as bare root. And then finally, we'll turn you on to some resources. Is anyone able, it doesn't matter if you're not, is anyone able to remove that little yellow line by annotate clearing? Can I do it? I can do it, Never mind. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so if that's what you're here for, then you've come to the right place. And if not, no harm, no foul, um, go out and garden. So in my day job, which I didn't mention in the intro, I'm a faculty member at Folsom Lake College where I direct uh, the Innovation Center of Discipline Agnostic General Education Makerspace. And, and so in my day job, we talk about outcomes, which are things that what, what I hope for you after this experience, having been at this experience. So I hope that you plant or expand a vegetable garden. I hope that you grow healthy and nutritious vegetables. To do that and to keep your plants healthy and safe, I hope you adopt IPM strategies, which we'll briefly talk about. And finally, I hope you are so, uh, your garden is so bountiful that you have an opportunity to share your surplus with neighbors or with food kitchens or with those less fortunate who could use fresh, healthy foods. So that's, that's why I'm here and that's what I hope happens for you. So let's talk a little bit about garden planning and management. Uh, and again, these are all, master gardeners have classes, like full classes on many or all of these things or, or combinations of these things. So I'm gonna just touch on a few things so that you can uh, plan and be prepared. And then you're gonna need to maybe dig deeper, um, not, no pun intended there, but it, to, to kind of get the, the nitty gritty on some of this stuff. So I'll talk a little bit about location, timing, soils, and fertilizers, irrigation seeds, and IPM. This is my garden, and this is my garden with the fall crop, uh, part of the fall crop in. So uh, the two beds in the, in the background are seeded right now to cover crop, which I'll talk about. The bed on the left is a mix of turnips and peas and radishes and other things. And the bed here on the right is garlic, which was October planted and looks like kale and some Napa cabbage. So. Napa cabbage was great this year. Uh, the kale was great, uh, but was uh, predated upon by, we'll talk about that later. So your garden is ideally located. Here's my garden and there's my summer garden. Um, you can see from the background that I, I garden in a clear cut uh, in the middle of the woods at, in Georgetown at about 3000 feet. And this, this clear cut aspect, the middle of the woods is actually a really significant um, challenge because if you look around there, all those trees are so excited to find loose organic soil with plenty of water and nutrition uh, just right outside their boundary. And so they, the soil here tends to get absolutely solid roots from the cedars and other trees around. And that's something that I, and that yields, uh, that leads to limited yields eventually. So uh, there are some strategies that I have to do to keep up on that. So I'm mostly in raised beds, um, which are separated from the ground so that because the roots will go up into raised beds right and fill them up as i mentioned so but in this photo i also see things like um, i need to know the relationship of those trees to where the sun is right and so the location of your garden is, is actually important and in our county based on where we are the sun is very different in the spring and in the summer and in the winter right the sun is really low in the sky in the winter and so this garden gets almost no direct sunlight for most of the winter. Um, so that's just something to be aware of and knowing how that how your garden looks in different seasons. You, the ideal location is has six to eight hours of sun. Uh, it's level ground ideally so that you don't sort of lose soils and you have uh, access to a water source. It's very difficult to do dry gardening in El Dorado County. You should be aware of parts of like if you see in this photo back by where the truck is, this is many, many years old, but there's a, a large oak tree that casts a shadow that moves throughout the day. And so knowing that you can exploit that. So if there are certain plants like peppers that really appreciate some respite from the afternoon sun, and if you know where a shadow is and you can kind of exploit that, that's a way that you can uh, really tune into the, the climate of your garden, or if you have low spots where cold air sinks and those kinds of things. And finally, your garden needs to be accessible. If you can't get to it, um, it's difficult to work, right? And a garden is work. 
they're not set and forget by and large in this county just based on the conditions that we have speaking of which here we are uh, i'm in georgetown again but you might be just peg this to placerville you should know a little bit i wouldn't hang up too much on this but you should know that there is such a thing as uh, usda garden zones and sunset western garden zones and so placerville and kind of north and south uh, are in 9a and you might also be in 9b if you're a little bit farther down the hill and you might be in 8b if you're a little farther up the hill what that really just means is you'll see that on on plants when you buy them you know hardy to zone whatever 7b and you'll sometimes see it on seed packets and and different things so it's just something to be aware of um, don't hang up too much on it because you can almost grow anything anywhere you just might have to end up babying it in really way, strange ways or building you know, protection around it or watering it in certain ways, but um, you should think about maximum yield and minimum space, right? You you ideally are growing spring and summer vegetables because you want to eat things. So you, uh, and that comes into play in spring and summer in particular because there's su certain plants or vegetables that take a lot of space and a lot of resources and yield less food than other things. I'm thinking of things like potatoes and corn and while those things are delicious, they can take a lot of space. And so you have, if you have uh, some space restrictions, you, you should consider that. Um, one way to consider that is to grow things up, right? So this is a, my garden from a couple of years ago, but I use a whole lot of T-posts and rebar to train things up. For instance, cucumbers and squashes, cantaloupe and those kinds of things. So you're able to kind of get more, more vegetables in a smaller area. And that also has some benefits. Keeping leaves off the ground can be beneficial uh, in terms of pests and diseases sometimes. I should mention my garden is, um, let's see, it's over 2000 square feet overall, uh, but it's about six or 700 square feet of uh, annuals. So a lot of, the, a lot of my proper garden is uh, annuity crops, fruit trees and, and blueberries and grapes and those kinds of things. So just to give you a sense of the scale that I'm gardening at. Gardening in containers. There's a, here's a Weber kettle makes a really good outside the kitchen herb garden. Um, so timing is really, really important. And we have, we break the, the vegetables classes up into spring and summer and fall and winter. And that's because gardening is a year round endeavor, but certain plants are, are well adapted to certain seasons and grow in a certain time. The best way to, to really get, especially if you're new to planting in uh, multi-season gardening, uh, spring and summer is the kind of the obvious garden and many people who garden start there and then move into multi-season or year-round gardening. But uh, if you're new to this county or if you're new to spring and summer gardening, this chart is the best thing. And I, I hope uh, perhaps Tracy or someone can put a link in the chat to how you can get a hold of one of these. We, um, Master Gardeners sell a laminated version of these. I think it's six bucks. And it's the most valuable thing. Uh, and I have two or three copies. I keep one by the computer. I keep one in the greenhouse. And it just helps you understand when, to, when you can seed things, when you should expect plants, and when you're planting out, and then when you can expect your harvest. So looking at the screen right now and looking at the planting guide in front of my face, we are right in the, in the left-hand corner. It says January, February, and there's a little seeding icon. We're right in the zone or right in the time frame when we're seeding early spring vegetables, which are the brassicas uh, or the cold crops. Um, so things like cabbage and cauliflower and lettuce, which is not a cold crop, but is a leaf crop. And we're just entering the time, right? It's, it's not February 1st yet, is it? I don't know, but we're, we're entering the time where we're gonna start thinking about seeding the full summer vegetables. These this. This chart is pegged to Placerville, but there's a little formula for slipping the dates because if you're higher up, your season is shorter, right? If you're up in uh, Apple Hill or you know up the hill that way, uh, your season is probably a little shorter. And if you're down the hill in Cameron Park or El Dorado Hills or something, then you can slip the dates the other way. Your season starts a little earlier, it's warmer sooner and lasts a little longer. So. Just a really great resource, and we, if we, when we do this class in person, we have them, and and I encourage folks to pick one up uh, because it's just. And the other side is the other class we teach is the fall and winter vegetables, um, which we're seeding usually in July and August, and then there's a, a window in October for planting things like uh, garlic and peas and other stuff. So 
timing is really important. Plant the wrong plant, or the a plant in the wrong season, and you may not have the results that you expect. And then also, as you learn, as you get into your garden, you will start to learn the timing of things just based on nature, right? So this is rhubarb, and rhubarb is one of the harbingers of spring in my garden. It's one of the first things to come up, as uh, rhubarb and asparagus are kind of the two um, earliest things that start to poke out of the soil. And when those happen, they're perennial, so they come up every year. And when that happens, I get excited because that means that spring is is on the way. It doesn't mean that it's suddenly spring, right? We always have these weather events uh, where it gets cold, et cetera. And I don't plant until Mother's Day uh, at my elevation anyhow. Uh, but we've had in Georgetown and probably where you are, we've had snow post Mother's Day before. So, uh, you know, just a, a way to get into the rhythm of your garden and really think about it um, as a year round endeavor. Planning is a good idea. Planning on paper and record keeping, taking photos. I should mention most of, almost all there, I think there's two photos in this presentation that aren't from my garden. Uh, I like to take pictures and write about my garden because it helps me to remember what variety was that? What did well? What do I like? What do I not like? Um, planning on paper can help you <clears throat> because you Need, can think you need to think about especially if you're if you have limited space you need to think about what the plant will look like and how long it exists in the ground right so in this this is more of a fall and winter or early spring um, kind of a garden but notice on the right is asparagus and so it may seem obvious but you wouldn't put asparagus in the middle of everything else because asparagus you plant and then can expect 15 to 20 to 25 years of production right you don't want to disturb it so you wouldn't put that in the middle of all this stuff and you would also know that asparagus grows to be, you know, six or seven feet high and might shade things. And so that's something to be aware of. Same with uh, onions and garlic or garlic in particular, which you put in October and which, um, and onions and which is not ready until, you know, the 4th of July. And so you, you wouldn't want to disturb that stuff. So just having an idea about the seasons and the timing and about moving plants, you don't want to grow the same thing in the same place uh, all the time, right? Um, and grouping plants by watering habits. Some plants are thirstier than others. And if you're kind of setting up, I, I find that setting up an automated drip system, even a not very sophisticated one, just with sort of garden timers or even twisty timers is helps with more consistent watering, but knowing that the plants on a particular run like the same amount of water is an important um, characteristic of planning. Knowing something about soils and fertilizer, we have whole classes on these kinds of things. And if I were you, I wouldn't obsess too much on it. When I was a new gardener in the county 20 some odd years ago, uh, I was, I had, I had gardened down in Los Angeles. And so I was very into understanding the chemistry of the soil. I, I like you maybe have that kind of red El Dorado County sort of hard soil, sometimes rocky, not a, not a whole lot of organic material. And so you ideally want a soil that's uh, 6.5 pH. That just means that how acidic it is. That's a slightly acidic, neutral to slightly acidic. You can get a soil test kit. You can send soil in and, and learn that stuff. What I would do where I you was just work your soil every year and think about your soil as an organism and as, as a thing that needs tending and caring and adding compost and cover cropping and some other stuff I'll mention. And the soil will trend to being neutral to slightly acid and good for plants. So you can either go the route of obsessing over it and amending it, or you can just sort of treat it as a year round and ongoing prospect of keeping and maintaining your soil. Plants require a lot of things. The most, the kind of reductionist, reductionist formula for what they need is NPK, which is what you see on a fertilizer bag, right? Um, nitrogen, generally speaking, is for leafy, leafy green growth, phosphorus for root development and potassium, which is some, which is a K, which I can never remember, but is a blossom and fruit size. Another way to think about this is shoots, roots, and fruits, right? So if you look at a fertilizer bag or bottle, I'm also should mention up front, I'm an organic gardener, so I only use things, um, only organic sources for nitrogen and for pest control. Here's a, a nice liquid fertilizer, and this is a general all-purpose 333, so balanced and rather low nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium which you know you can mix in buckets and fertigate or you can mix in 30 or whatever 50 gallon 
tubs and fertigate or that you can add as a in a granular form at the time you plant or scratch into the soil uh, beside the plants during the growing season or foliar feed, or there's a lot of ways to, to fertilize. One of the biggest and most important things that I think you can do for your garden is to find a way to compost, even at small scale, right? There's ways to do this that doesn't require a big pile and a big outdoor space. There are little under cabinet worm bins. We have some, um, Cindy is uh, the expert in worm stuff. And so we, we have classes on this and you can create little worm bins where the worms are kind of composting your kitchen scraps. Or if you have access to animal manures, here's a big pile of horse manure from a neighbor. Um, it's just a good idea to add organic material to the soil. It lightens it up. It increases its water holding capacity. It adds nutrition. Um, it makes the soil more active with microbes and fungi and other things. And so people always ask, how do you know it's, is it too hot? How do you know it's ready? I, if there's weeds growing in it and worms crawling in it, I feel like it's ready. That's how I gauge it. Um, so if you drive your hand in that, it's full of worms and you're good to go. That's how I do it. Um, if you have, and small scale barnyard manures are great. If you keep rabbits or if you're a homesteader and have other, um, other animals, and this is a nice closed loop, right? Rabbit gets carrots, rabbit produces manure, manure grows carrots, et cetera. It's a nice kind of permaculture-y inputs and outputs and circular thing. Ducks love to turn compost and uh, root out little grubs and things and um, fertilize it in the process and keep it turned and aerated. Cover cropping is another strategy. So this is my garden under full cover crop uh, when I was doing most of my gardening right in the ground. Cover cropping just means planting um, a mix of uh, usually some legumes and some annual grasses that you plant specifically to uh, mulch up and, and till into the soil for soil nutrition. And so here, this is uh, just a generalized cover crop mix. It's bell beans and field peas and vetch and oats and annual rye grasses and so forth. Usually you buy this in bulk and it's pretty inexpensive. I always plant in October uh, because any, well, it used to be that it always rained by Halloween. That's not necessarily true anymore, but you, the idea is that you get this in the ground when it doesn't need you to water it and is watered by rainfall. It grows up, legumes by the way, are, the, are plants in that family, which are peas and beans and um, even some non-native invasives like uh, Scotch broom, which is a horrible plant, but um, is a legume. And there's the uh, native bear clover is a non-leguminous nitrogen fixer. But anyway, what legumes do is they, they these little nodes and nodules on the roots are plant available nitrogen. So based on some, some bacteria and other things in the roots of these plants, they're able to take nitrogen from the air and make it plant available. So it's a good thing. Plants like nitrogen. Here is just yesterday. So this is my garden today, well, yesterday, and you can see in the right-hand box here that the cover crop, that, that box is full of a cover crop, and the cover crop is being crushed by snow, but it'll be just fine. So what happens is the cover crop grows, and when it gets really cold, it sort of stunts out and stops work, stops moving, and then in the spring when it starts to warm up, it grows lush and uh, amazing. You get a kid to Chop about two weeks in a warm year and three or four weeks in a cold year. You get a kid to chop it up and till it into this, then you till it into the soil. This kid, by the way, is 23 now, but um, you know, kids gotta, kids gotta work. And, um, and you till it into the soil and then it breaks down over the course of a couple of weeks um, and you end up with um, just a nice rich organic soil. So my soil, as I mentioned, was that red hard, you could throw a pot with it. And it's now over many, many years, a nice, um, just or filled with organic material, lots of worms, lots of other things going on. I mentioned the root problem. Um, when I was growing in the ground, every couple of years, I had to double dig, which means you dig a big old trench, and then you dig again. And, and try and kind of get the soil work down to a really deep level. So in this case, I actually dug this trench and then ran a tiller in the trench to kind of get some of the, the roots out. And eventually I lost this battle and went to more or less all raised bed for my annual stuff, just because 
over time, just the plants were not being able to outcompete the tree roots and, and I was seeing declining yields. And um, so I've corrected that by uh, moving above ground. But you think, think of your soil as an, as an organism and feed your soil, not your plants is the best way. Have good soil and, and your plants will thank you in a lot of ways. Talk a little bit about watering. Here's a, you know, maybe you have one of these in your garden, a DIY manifold that is doing, has, there's a combination of overhead sprinklers, hoses, drip, timers, et cetera, kind of moving. I don't have permanent, um, permanent irrigation in my garden. So I kind of set this up and tear it down every year, which is getting to be a pain by the way, but, um, but strategies for wa watering or to, for keeping plants in the right water is mulching, right? So mulching means putting some organic material on top of the soil to keep the sun, basically the sun from evaporating water in the soil. So it, it, it keeps the, the soil moist and cooler, which encourages worms and other things to come up higher and till it in. Um, having a rich organic soil with lots of compost or lots of organic material. Selecting the right plants, right? You may not want to spend a bunch of water on, on plants that are super, super thirsty. And in drought years, where I think we're in, I think we're still in a, I was looking at the chart the other day. But anyway, in drought years, sometimes I, I have made decisions. Like I made decisions about caneberries. I lost uh, or decided to let go of raspberries. I grew a really great raspberry. It's called dinkum and it's an everbearing, meaning you can mow it to the ground and it grows raspberries on this year's growth. So you don't have to manage it the way you manage caneberries. But, um, but it just took too much water. I couldn't water it enough to keep it alive in the location that it was. So I had to sort of make a decision to let that go. And then I lost an asparagus bed to that decision. Asparagus once established is really drought tolerant, but uh, I did not take care of it in the way it needed to be. And I actually lost an asparagus bed, which is a drag, which we'll talk about later because asparagus takes a long time to get ready. So, But drip irrigation is the most efficient and effective way to irrigate. And it used to be really complicated, even as, as you know, even 10 years ago, it was more complicated than it is now. But anymore, it's a pretty plug and play system and master gardeners have lots of, uh, we offer classes about it and so forth. I do a little bit of rain catchment. So I have a rain barn over my greenhouse and I capture that much water, which funny, you'd think that's a big tank. It fills up in like one storm and and I could almost have an endless amount of tanks and, and store that store an endless amount of water. But uh, I use it to supplement um, a little orchard in the dry times. So let's talk about seeds and starting seeds. We mentioned the timing in the, the vegetable guide and that we're right in the time where we're going to be planting some seeds. Starting from seed is a really great and economical way to, to garden and gives you access to varieties. There's no shame and no harm in starting from six packs from the nursery either. So um, you should be, feel proud to do either, but seeds give you access to a lot of things that you can't necessarily find um, off the shelf. And seed libraries is a great thing. Look it up if you're interested. This is the one at Folsom Lake College. Um, Master Gardeners have one or had one. Um, it's just the idea that you check out seeds. And these will be seeds that are open pollinated and heirloom varieties, so they're not hybrids, which means that they will, the next generation of seeds will be the same plant, which is not true in the case of hybrids. And so um, you check out some seeds, you grow stuff and save some seeds and return them to the library. It's a nice concept. When you're starting from seed, you have to be you have to consider soil temperature, water, and air. So soil is a little bit of a misnomer. It's better to plant seeds in sort of a sterile planting mix than garden soil because of uh, fungus and other things that might, pathogens that might be in the soil. But a good seed starting mix, you can buy those commercially. You can look up the formula for UC, that's University of California mix. They have a lot of different kind of formulas. They typically, seed starting mixes are usually peat moss and perlite and then some combination of other things like fir bark or forest product and sometimes vermiculite, sometimes sand, et cetera. But you can just find a, uh, at, the, at the nursery, you can buy a bag of a seed, nice seed starting mix. Be aware that some of, the, some of those contain chemical fertilizers. So, so it might not be obvious. It's probably obvious by the brand, but you should, be aware of that if you are an organic gardener and don't want to use those kinds of sources. The seeds, by the way, don't care where they get their nitrogen from. So um, they couldn't care less if it was 
mechanical or chemical or any other thing, uh, but you might care. Uh, temperature is a, is a big component of starting seeds. So seeds break dormancy usually at a particular temperature, which is why seeds, you know, more or less lots of them germinate in the spring as it starts to get warm. Seeds need to be kept moist, but not soggy, right? And seeds, so on the flip side of that is seed need, seeds need air, right? They need to, to be able to not be sort of drowning in water. There's lots of great sources for seeds. Um, the seed packet here will, on the backside will often tell you um, lots of things, lots of information about how close to plant things, how deep to plant things. As a general rule of thumb, little seeds get planted shallowly and big seeds get planted deeply. Uh, that's just, you know, if you think about, it just seems to make sense. This is a story about 18 molar sulfuric acid. And so seeds need, some seeds need additional help. You'll see this on seed packets sometimes. Morning glory seeds is the one I can think of right now, but they talk about scarifying the seeds. So that means either scratching it or using a nail file, or uh, in this case, I use some really like heinous acid that I got from a chemist for, these are elderberry seeds, which are meant to, a lot of seeds are meant to go through a bird, right? And get into the crop or the gullet, whatever they call it in a bird, where, where with a little bit of sand or grit, the seed is kind of being worn down so that it can break dormancy. And if you actually zoom in on these, these are post acid soaked seeds. You can see the pitting that the acid did and they, they germinated fine, but I did a, com a comparison experiment and the, the ones I just soaked did almost as well. So it was, it was interesting, but not really worth the trouble. It took up like a box of baking soda to neutralize that acid, so. So there's some seeds in a seed starting mix, important to, um, to, I'm gonna mute for one second and cough. It's important to mark the seeds so you know what you planted. These are, um, thrift stores are an endless supply of mini blinds, right? <laughs> that you can cut and make markers out of. Um, and then seeds are ideally in a sunny, location or a lighted location. Here they are, a long time ago, I used to use it. This is a jewelry case from a thrift store. I can't remember where I got it, but um, it's actually too hot. It got to be about 210 F in the summer or in the early spring. So, but they like to have air circulation and light, right? Which is difficult, right? This time of year, when we're planting seeds in February, if you don't have a, an outside greenhouse or another um, thing, um, it can be difficult. So I, I start seeds in this greenhouse, which is not strong enough to, to handle the snow. So I had to build a rain barn on top of it, which is collecting water for that thing. Um, but that's where I start my seeds. You can start them on a windowsill. You can start them uh, in, you know, indoors on a windowsill where they get some light. You can supplement uh, with light. And then I like to, on days where it's early spring days, where it's, when it's warm, I like to, you know, um, both harden seeds off, which means, you know, if they're used to certain conditions, uh, babied conditions, you need to, before you plant them, you need to kind of get them used to the, the real world, the harshness of the real world by letting them spend some time out of doors. But you also have the benefit here of lots of sunlight, lots of fresh air. Sunlight's a great sort of disinfectant for, for lots of fungus and other things. And, um, and especially things like tomatoes, you've probably seen tomatoes when you, when they have low light conditions for seedlings, they get really long and leggy, right? They're stretching and trying to find light. So these are some really nice stout tomato seedlings. Um, and I give them as much real light as I can in the season. People ask about those Jiffy peat pots. I think this is an interesting photo. Um, they work to germinate seeds, but, but um, notice the pot there on the right, and you know most of the the root growth was not in that pot. This was planted deep, but um, they work all right. They're not my favorite way to plant things, but try it out if you have access to them. If you have a speedling tray, which is more of a professional nursery thing, but you can get them commercially. They make these great um, four-sided pyramid plugs. This is uh, French sorrel, uh, which is a sour, a wonderful sour. Um, and is using a uh, Russian soup called shav and, and salads and it's a nice lemony, super sour thing. But uh, plant in whatever you can, for, uh, six packs that you've cleaned from last season, et cetera. And, 
and go to one of our classes on, we have classes on seed saving and starting and those kinds of things. So integrated pest management, really briefly, IPM is the, the, a philosophy and a set of practices about managing pests and diseases in the garden. And the first one is prevent, right? Keep plants healthy. Um, and you do that by doing all the things we just talked about, by having good soil, planting the right plant in the right season, having appropriate water, um, appropriate light, appropriate airflow, uh, et cetera. And if you encounter a problem, then know exactly what it is, right? And a good way to do that is to contact the master gardeners. Uh, in the old days, you would find a bug and you would freeze it in a bag and bring it into the master gardener um, office. Um, but I'll share some resources to help you identify. It's important to know what the problem is because you might be solving the wrong problem if, if, um, if, you're, if you don't know what it is, right? Uh, everyone knows this problem, probably if you've ever gardened for any length of time, you have had this problem. To correctly identify this, I mean, I know what this is, you probably know what this is, but it's aphids on mustard. Um, they also often, insects and things often congregate on the bottom sides of the leaves out of the sun and out of the, the sight of birds and so forth. Um, you can identify an aphid by these cornicles, these little um, little antennae type things. They're not antennae, but they're little things on the back of his body or her body. And you would deal with, aph you would deal with um, aphids in a very mechanical way by spraying them off with a hose. That's the best way to deal with aphids. You can use uh, insecticidal soap to do that as well. But if you spray those, the hard water spray on that leaf will knock those aphids off. You might have to do it a couple times or a couple times a day or a couple times over a course of days, but they're not gonna find their way back to that plant and they'll die and drown. So here's a problem um, that kind of looks like, this is a, looks like a cabbage or a, something of that. And you might think you know what that is. And it might be related to this problem. This is on a broadleaf. I was getting this in my garden, broadleaf plants of all kinds. This is on a sunflower, but it was happening to squash and other things. And the former problem was cabbage moth, uh, moths from these, or excuse me, caterpillars from these moths, the larval stage of these. And the, the latter problem was finches, right? And so just looking at those skeletonized leaves, you might try to put BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is an organic um, anti-caterpillar treatment. Uh, and that doesn't, wouldn't take care of the problem if your problem was in fact a goldfinch lesser or whatever kind of goldfinch this is. Now, this is not really a problem to solve, right? You want goldfinches in your garden, I think. Um, but just knowing that. Here's a new one for me. This is this year. This was a couple of weeks ago before the snows. And this was happening to all my, my kale was looking so good. And then it all started coming up like this. And when it first started happening, I thought, well, there's not cat, there shouldn't be caterpillars right now. It's too cold, right? Caterpillars are usually a spring phenomenon. And so I looked and checked for that, wasn't that. Then I thought hairs, right? I was starting to get a lot of hairs on the game cams, game cam. Uh, but I've kept rabbits before and rabbits would not, they wouldn't, in my experience, they would have eaten this whole thing down to the ground or pulled on it, pulled it out, you know, and eaten the stalk and the leaves and everything. And then it turns out this is new to me. It was tree squirrels. I caught them doing it. And I've never known tree squirrels to be, to do that. I've known ground squirrels to do that. In the master gardener training, someone, the uh, person who taught the pest class said, how do you know the difference between a ground squirrel and tree squirrel? And he said, if you chase it and it goes in the ground, it's a ground squirrel. If it goes up a tree, it's a tree squirrel. But um, I've never known those tree squirrels to do this. So that's new to me. And not a lot you can do about that except exclude them. So then I put chicken wire and other things over some of them to keep some of this off. But they did ruin that whole crop of kale. You can notice on the top there, that's actually re-sprouting. And I don't think I left it in the ground, but it might have recovered, but it was pretty, pretty badly damaged. So, And once you know, again, know, knowing what it is and controlling and dealing with it. Uh, in the old days, broad spectrum, spectrum insecticides was the way that we dealt with uh, problems. These days, mechanical controls, exclusion, uh, and, and really just like, like taking a deep breath and accepting minor damage. Most of us are gardeners not, be, not out of absolute necessity, 
but because we enjoy it and we like to have fresh food. And so you might just accept a little bit of damage on your tomatoes or on your squash and just not get hung up on it. And if you must use things like, use things like BT and insecticidal soap, and if you feel the need to use chemicals, then really understand, read the, read the package, know how long you have to wait to harvest, know what kinds of things it is meant to control. I should add here, to, um, diatomaceous earth is a really good organic one um, that'll get a lot of insects, but needs a lot of reapplication. Uh, it's a particularly good for flea beetles, which get to uh, eggplant a lot. So uh, here's strawberries. Don't ever use this bird netting on the ground because it'll catch every lizard or snake in a thousand mile radius and they'll die and stink and it's horrible. It's like a drift net for lizards, which you want in the garden. And that didn't exclude the pest or predator in this case, which is a little rat living in a shed next door. So the solution there, and, and she would collect the strawberries and just bring them to the nest and eat strawberries. Um, this kind of, this is my blueberry patch, which is originally I put chicken wire up, but it was too, it kept out the gross beaks, but didn't handle the finches. So I had a second layer of a smaller thing to keep the birds out. Um, Slugs, you can look up controls for those. People always ask about deer. Really the only, there's lots of sort of folk remedies for deer, hair and coyote urine and eggs and whatever. Uh, really fence, strong fences, dogs are the way to take care of deer. Um, and deer will eat anything, even things that are deer resistant. This was, this, I grew walnut. I grow walnuts. I have a couple of walnuts out in the woods and walnuts are known. They, they have compounds in their roots and leaves and that are like toxic to other, they're allelopathic, meaning they're toxic to other plants. But the deer came out and ate, I had a beautiful walnut going and the deer came out and ate it to the ground and I had to then protect it out in the forest. So uh, that's that's a rattlesnake. Um, I actually, I don't like them in my garden, but I like them around because they eat meadow voles and gophers. Here's a bigger snake, um, California king or a mountain king, California king. Um, but you want these kinds of things in your garden, right? You want to not put a bunch of um, chemicals in the garden. You want to encourage these um, kinds of communities of animals and the life that happens and the interconnectedness of all that stuff and, and how ladybugs, uh, more in their larval stage, which looks like a little sort of described as an alligator, but to me, it looks more like the, do you ever see the Wrath of Khan where the, they put those things like in Chekhov's ear, the little seti eel things? That's what they look like to me, but they eat a lot of aphids. So you wanna encourage these kinds of natural behaviors. You wanna encourage, uh, or at least not be worried about foxes uh, in the garden because they're gonna eat meadow voles. Foxes come to my compost every every night and they drag weird things out. I mean, they like eggshells, they'll, but they'll drag coffee, ground, coffee filters out and other things, but. So that's just an absolute whirlwind tour through some things you need to consider as you prepare your garden. And again, there's, there's volumes written on those things. Master gardeners can offer you uh, sage advice, pick up the vegetable planting guide, especially if you're new to gardening in the county and, and go to master gardener classes and learn deep things about all those things. We're moving now and transitioning into uh, the spring vegetables. So these are the things on the chart that are, that we're planting, we're seeding now right? And so the planting guide has broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and lettuce. And also uh, into February and March, we're talking about carrots and radishes um, and onions from seed and chard. And I don't, I didn't mention potatoes, but I think I talk about potatoes in here because they're sort of a, sort of a March phenomenon in this county. So we'll talk about those, then we'll transition to the full-on full heat of summer, the classics, tomatoes, and those kinds of things. So without further ado, this is a uh, broccoli. If you let broccoli go, it will flower. Um, if you think about this, interesting to me, you, you, most of the things we think about as vegetables, our summer vegetables in particular, we're growing for the fruit, right? The fruiting bodies, the sweet or the fleshy thing that contains the seeds, right? So think about tomatoes and, and peppers and stuff. And fall and winter vegetables, we're largely growing for immature flowers and leaves. So if you think about broccoli or if you think about kale or cauliflower, right? And so 
these early spring things are more like fall and winter vegetables. And in fact, you can plant most of these as a fall crop that will either you'll harvest um, by December or that will overwinter. And honestly, sometimes depending on your aphid situation, that is often a better time to plant because in early spring and anymore, aphids last a long time, it seems, even into the, I, I noticed this year aphids into, you know, into November and, um, but sometimes it, aphids and, and flying uh, those moths can be a, a, a big problem for early spring. So consider that and you might wanna plant these things in as a fall and winter crop, but you can sneak in a crop of all this stuff if you plant now. These are called the coal crops or cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferae is the, or brassica, but anyway, cruciferae meaning cross, which is they, they have this characteristic of having a four petaled um, cross shaped flower like that. So. And they all are more or less treated the same. That is, they like the same um, conditions. They like a rich, deep soil, right? With lots of organic material. Especially if you're planting as a spring crop, you wanna look for the word short or early on the seed packet or on the six pack, because you really wanna get these sort of in the ground and out by May, June. Uh, they tend to not do well in the heat anyway. And by that time there might be significant um, aphid issues and other things. So you're looking for those words. Uh, again, I mentioned fall might be a better time, but try it. There's no reason not to try it and just know that you might have to be dealing with certain pest issues because lots of things like these plants, um, lots of chewing things and aphids and other stuff. Um, and side dressing with fertilizer means kind of scratching um, along the rows if you grow in rows, scratching in the side so that fertilizer so that um, then it kind of leaches down to the soil where the roots are. Those are just generalized. If this is a um, this is a Romanesco or this is a beautiful, this is actually from my garden uh, and it's pretty small, um, but just a beautiful form, a fractal form of flowers. These plants are really hardy generally. So here's some fall cabbages. They'll sit under snow. They, a lot of them sweeten up even after a frost. And so they're, they're pretty hardy in the right season, although they don't really take the heat well. Um, they're just more of the same. And then you should, Consider that it's it's a little difficult sometimes to grow market size like what you would buy in the market size broccoli or cauliflower, right? Um, those things might have a lot of uh, agricultural fertilizers added, or might be varieties or grown in places that are frankly better for these kinds of crops. These are more things that like kind of cooler, steadier conditions, coastal valleys, those kinds of things. Um, but don't hesitate to try and grow them because you can get really nice broccoli in the county. You want to look for ones that mature in 60 to so 60 be on the early side to 110 days. Um, that's especially important in the spring. Aphids and worms, right? These are worms is kind of the wrong word there, but um, aphids and caterpillars uh, are the problem. You can use row covers, floating row covers, which are a lightweight. This is a handkerchief, but it's a lightweight material that you could lay over the top of the plants or with a supporting wire and it keeps flying things from kind of going onto the plant. Um, so they can be very effective at, at screening out essentially uh, pests. And calabrese or calabrese is the, the variety that many gardeners like as a home variety. It's a re-sprouting or re-heading broccoli. So it grows a central head that's not like market size, but a nice a decent sized middle bit. And then it, uh, you can harvest that and it makes a little sort of broccoli florets at all the nodes around the plant. So you kind of get a longer harvest um, and, and it's a good, and you know, it's tasty. So good variety to try. This is not my photo, but I just think it's too beautiful not to include. This is like a Romanesco. Uh, just look at that. Look at the math of nature. Here's a cauliflower that I grew and that was maybe, you know, so between softball and baseball size. And I felt that was very, I felt very successful. That's the biggest cauliflower I've ever grown. Um, but again, kind of tuning your expectations to, to that might've been set in a certain way by buying stuff at the market. And it might, you might find it's a little different. But if you have, if you, if you've never grown these kinds of plants, then if you think about what a plant needs to, the bare minimum of a plant needs to exist is it's more or less got to have leaves, right? Not universally true, but generally true. Um, it won't necessarily make a beautiful flower, but it, it's got to have leaves. And so go for the, the plants in this category that, that are for leaves, which include 
kale here, right? So there's lots of kales all the rage and has been for years. Uh, wonderful plant, really good for you. Um, here's tatsoi or spoon mustard. So this is a very tender um, Asian green, not as strongly flavored mustard as, and here, if you're not familiar with the terminology, a mustard plant is leaves and then they get mustard like, you know, condiment mustard from grinding up the seeds. Um, but the leaves here, are, this is a delicious plant and a small, it's a little, it's a little, little plant, great for stir fry, fresh eating. Kohlrabi is fun to, fun to grow. This is a plant that is grown for its, um, the round uh, fleshy stem there, which is, it's like a big apple made out of the inside of the broccoli stem, like that really good tender. Collards are good. This is a variety called, I think, greasy. Um, and next to it, speaking, Tracy, of scarlet runner beans, um, this is cohabitating with some scarlet runner beans. And I point that out only because collards can last a lot longer than some of these other, um, than broccoli or other things. They can persist into heat in ways that other, some of these plants don't do as well. So um, consider growing collards, consider growing mustards. This is a giant red mustard guy, lantern guy choy, uh, very strongly flavored, um, really wonderful mustard if you're into strongly flavored mustards. This one's a little long in the tooth, but, uh, so this must be a late spring or early summer, but um, just a really good stir fry vegetable. And here's a mixed bed, right, of there's some mustards in there, that red one, um, and in with some chard, right? So uh, grow some leaves and eat them. This was this year, um, this would be a fall crop, but you can try to plant some Napa cabbage. I, the Napa cabbage just came out really well this year. Just delicious. That's a, a whole big bowl of harvested greens. Why do I have that there? It's a radish. Radishes are allies and related to these plants, and we might be moving into talking about radishes. This is a new one I tried this year. Look it up. It's called bald head. No, it's a mustard. Sorry, that's why. Never mind. It's bald head mustard. Look it up anyway. But it creates a, um, so it makes a mustard leaf, but it also creates essentially like a turnip-like or radish-like um, fleshy stem. I haven't harvested them yet, but look it up. It's my, it's my new thing for this year, bald head mustard. Look it up. Let's talk about lettuce. So lettuce on the chart, we are um, seeding January and February, and, and we should expect plants in March. And then we should expect to be harvesting April through June. So here's a mixed, uh, mixed bed of lettuce. Lettuce is, has wonderful form. There's some trout back here. There's some uh, red oak leaf, black seeded Simpson, lots of varieties. Um, lettuce has sh rather shallow matted roots. So it, like other leafy plants, it likes a good, uh, good organic soil with some nitrogen. Lettuce is a tiny seeded uh, plant. And so it likes to be sown um, very lightly scratched into the surface, really. So if you throw out some lettuce and just kind of scratch it in with a, a rake or, um, cause it also light is a trigger for lettuce, um, thinning it. So plants generally speaking, I didn't talk about this, but when you're, you can go by the spacing on the seed packet, which is really usually very wide, or you can think about how big will the plant be when it's, it's biggest, right? So a lettuce might be that big and you want to plant the next lettuce such that the leaves are just right next to each other or just barely touching, but not overlapping a lot, right? And so that's one way to think about planting. And, and so that's different for every plant. Lettuce gets to be about that big, a big cabbage or a big broccoli can be you know, that big, um, but you wanna thin these, lettuce in particular, because it doesn't like to sort of compete against its neighbors and you can thin. So I like to scatter plant lettuce and then just thin the little, little lettuce. You can eat that, pull it up by the root and then, uh, Later, as you kind of get your spacing right, then you can start harvesting by um, by taking just the outer leaves, right? And, and not cutting the whole plant down, but leaving it to keep going. And you take say a third of the leaves from any one particular plant, you make a nice salad out of that and you get a harvest over a, a extended period of time. Fertilizing, they like nitrogen. These are just leafy plants, right? Um, frequent shallow watering, because they have sort of, they have a sort of central tap root carrot-like a little bit, but then they have just a lot of small roots on the surface, so they don't like to be dried out. They don't like to be water stressed or heat stressed, right? So the issue with lettuce grown out is that when it gets warm, it starts to bolt. And bolting just means it start, it'll look long and leggy, it'll throw up a flower spike, make, make wonderful um, fluffy seeds, but it becomes unpalatable and awful at that point. So if it bolts, 
and is bitter. That's why growing it, it's an early spring crop because by the time we get to May and June, once it gets hot, it just, it goes. And then it's only the chickens will eat it, but it's not good to eat. So problems, there are some problems of lettuce, some things like the leaves. Um, there are some kinds of rots, botrytis and other things that can get to it. Um, but I, I don't find it to be particularly problematic in terms of pests and diseases. The really the thing is if it gets warmer, there's a warm spell, even early out of season, the lettuce might bolt and then you sort of lost the crop for that year. So uh, it comes in loose head, loose leaf, romaine and crisp head. Loose head what types are the bib lettuces or the butterhead? They have kind of a different mouth feel. Um, you can try and grow some of those, but if you've never grown lettuce or you wanna have real success, high chance of success, grow, pick a loose leaf lettuce. Uh, and and grow that. There's they're more forgiving. They don't need to make a particular kind of a head. They just are sort of growing plants. Romaine is kind of the elongated, fleshy midrib. Um, Caesar salad lettuce, Paris Island Coes is the classic variety there. And you can try. There are supposedly iceberg type lettuces that'll grow in home gardens, but um, no one that I know has had success growing them there. A particular a particular kind of lettuce. So here's just some varieties you might note: butter crunch. Um, and red oak leaf, black seed Simpson. And I like Thai green and Jericho. I don't have on here, but as a loose leaf, they, Thai green and Jericho both seem to stand longer without bolting. So they can be, you can extend the season a little longer into the warm time. And then Paris Island Coes, as I mentioned, is kind of the classic romaine type lettuce. Let's talk about carrots, which we're seeding uh, usually direct sown. I, I didn't mention this for the other things, but you, you're you mostly seeding those things, the coal crops and lettuces. Uh, I wouldn't seed them directly right now just because of the snow, but but you are mostly can you can start those in a six pack or lettuce a little later if the ground is not um, under snow. Um, you can start those directly, but otherwise you're starting those in six packs. Carrots, generally speaking, anything that you're growing for roots, you're going to plant directly in the ground um, in place in February, March, and April. Um, late February, March, and April for carrots. Soil is important, right? Because the part of the plant you care about is below the soil. So you don't, you don't want to have a compact soil with rocks and so forth. You want to give it a loose area in which to grow. Carrots take a long time to germinate and a long time to grow. And so um, you'll want to plant them early and maybe not expect to get carrots, you know, until whenever, August, September, October, November. Variety is important only because carrots are you you if you want to have good success you don't want to grow you know super long carrots that you give horses but you want to grow carrots that are in sort of the six inch and tapered range thinning is important right um, as it is with other things but here the thinning is you need to consider that the part you're interested in is below the surface so you don't want to be crowding a bunch of carrots in a small space down here so you kind of need to um, consider that. Pests, eh, white flies, some things get to the tops of carrots. Every once in a while, you'll get some things chewing holes like James and the giant peach holes in a carrot. You just cut that part out and eat them anyway because they take so long. And they like, make sure your soil has phosphorus, right? Because roots, um, either by adding that at the time, you know, working the soil and knowing you have that, or that's really the way to do it because phosphorus doesn't move a lot in the soil. So you kind of want to, till that in before you plant. Shorter varieties, long harvest period, taper carrots, right? Um, here's a, this is not my photo, but this has been in this present. I used to teach this class with um, Gay Craig and Carolyn Stromberg, no, neither of whom is with us any longer, may they rest in peace. But this has been, this one slide has been in this presentation for however long I've been a master gardener, so. Um, but right there at, at D, at D, right? I read the six to seven inch carrot, Nantes and Danver, the two classic varieties for the home gardener and anything shorter, right? You can, that, any more, there's fun carrots like whatever, Thumbelina and purple carrots and lots of things that are a little shorter. Um, and this is just because it takes so long and they're, they're particular about um, soil compaction and stuff. So to ensure your success, try it, you know, start with those. And then if you get really into carrots, you can, you know, people prepare like super deep beds for carrots and um, high sand kind of uh, soil mixes and so forth. So that's just carrot foliage. By the look at the shadow or the light. That's by carrot foliage by the light of an eclipse. When the eclipse happens, it gets that the multiple kind of nested circles. 
Uh, radishes is pretty easy to grow. It's a shame. A lot of kids don't maybe don't like radishes, but they're one of the easiest things to grow. Um, using as a nurse plant, so that means you're mixing car carrot and radish seeds together and just sowing them all together. And the radishes will come up. The carrots might not germinate for you know weeks and weeks, and you'll forget where you planted them, but the radishes will come up. And then as you're pulling the radishes, you're thinning the carrots. Um, radishes appreciate some hot weather makes them kind of very bitter and woody and and are strongly flavored. And so you can interplant them in the shade of tomatoes, for instance, to try and extend the season. Um, and there are some radishes you, you can eat, you know, of course, whatever radish tops, but there are some you can look for seed packets where they talk about the tops as well. There are some that have particularly fleshy tops um, that can be good in salads. And, you know, any more, this is just a standard kind of red radish, but any more you can get icicle types and Asian types and um, French breakfast radishes that are those blushing pink kind and so forth and green ones. And I grew dragon's tongue, uh, which is a potting radish this year. That's another new addition to my garden. All radishes will make these pods, but not all of them are, are selected for the uh, a nice tender fleshy pod. So this radish grows that and then you can just eat that or stir fry it sort of like a, a pea or a bean. So I've grown um, rat dragon's tongue this year. I've grown one called rat tail, which is kind of an ugly name for a radish, but, but um, look for a potting radish if you're potting P-O-D-D-I-N-G. If you're um, if you're interested in kind of stretching your radish lore, notice the flower there too. It's a it's a cross shaped flower. So <clears throat> let's move into onions and shallots. These are onions. So I mentioned that I take photos of my garden. Part of that is because I learned what I did wrong. The spacing is not right here. These onions are too close together. Um, onions come in strong and mild and bunching and multiplier and top setting tops, strong or American type radishes, red, yellow, and white, mild, more sweet radishes, excuse me, uh, onions in red, yellow, and white, scallions, which you eat for the greens, multiplier potato onions, which sort of act like shallots in that they under the soil or at the soil, they kind of cluster together and top setting onions. Uh, onions also are day length dependent. So if you drew a line from San Francisco to Washington, DC, everyone north of that line should grow long day onions and everyone south of that line should grow short day onions or in the middle half of California, um, you can try an intermediate day or a day neutral onion. And problems of onions, if they if you have the wrong kind or the wrong conditions, they the one on the top sort of semi bulb, the one on the bottom doesn't bulb up at all and flowers instead. Um, there's a kind of a close-up. You can still eat the greens and you can eat the greens of all onions. They taste like green onions and they make a good broth and a soup. Um, there's lots of alliums in general are lots of, there's ornamental, you may be seeing these as an ornamental plant, but they're also a, a wonderful plant to grow. Shallots uh, are great and and they, you put one in and it becomes, you know, seven or 10 or 15 or or sometimes depending on the variety, like five definitive ones. So I planted the one in the middle and it branched out, I love this photo, it branched out into five other ones, right? And shallots have that rich flavor and they're a pain to deal with to process, but you can sort of just put them all in a baking tray and slow roast them into make just a shallot mush that you can freeze. Uh, here's a top setting, uh, an Egyptian walking onion, uh, which grows upright and makes these bowl bills, these little onions or shallots or even garlic will do this. And then that will fall over and root and et cetera. So that's kind of the walking. So that's a top setting onion. Something to try if you're into interesting plants. This is uh, elephant garlic, which is, I'm spacing on the name. What's the, anyway, it's not actually garlic, but it's uh, in a similar family, which makes sort of this central fleshy pod and makes these little escape pods. Um, but grows well. Here's some potato onions, um, which is kind of old fashioned clumping onions that I planted out in the woods. Um, here's an idea. Yeah, generally speaking, you don't plant things you buy at the market, but sometimes they grow. The onions are pretty resilient. This is the, you know, the chef's mustache cut off from an onion and it's growing any, with just that part and growing up from under it. But um, onions you can plant from seed or from um, you can buy, so seed, it takes a little longer. You'll, you'll probably have good success. Don't buy them as 
uh, bulbs when the bulb season happens. They don't tend to do as well. It says that in the MG handbook and, and my own experience confirms it. Or you can just buy a six pack of onions, which look like grass and using a hard water spray and a fork or something, you can tease that apart into like 300 individual sort of stalks of onion. They're very resilient that you think they'd be fragile, but they're not. And you can plant each one of those and get a whole lot of onions out of a six pack if you're not growing from seed. Potatoes are one of those crops, they take a lot of space and they don't yield as much as maybe some other things, but they're fun to grow and they're delicious. Um, get certified virus-free seed potatoes, um, it, which are ones you would buy um, either that you, you'll just buy them in bins during, you know, from a nursery or you can order them. Um, they're a plant that you hill up. So you sort of plant them deep in a trench and then you add soil because they will root and send potatoes out at all the nodes. Um, they like light frequent watering. They're hard to keep alive in my garden just because they, they get to be really, they're very water, they're very thirsty. Uh, over fertilizing with, with nitrogen will give you a hollow heart. Um, so don't do that. They make a pretty flower that bees like. Um, but you basically get a potato you cut it into chunks so there's a couple of eyes on each chunk. You let them dry out a little bit uh, for a day or two out of the sun so that that cut surface isn't really moist. And then you put each one of those in and you get a, a plant. And then you could hill up around this plant. They have neat foliage. Um, and then you get a potato manatee, maybe. Um, this is maybe red, uh, yellow fin or some kind of a fingerling type potato. Some varieties I've grown just um, of different types. If you like the blue ones or Yukon Gold is the classic, yellow fin, um, there's a lot of potatoes and they're related to, they're in the nightshades, so they're related to peppers and, and tomatoes and suffer from some of the same diseases. So now we're into the full-on summer plants. These are peppers. Every year I grow a lot of hot peppers. I like to, peppers are really good in my garden every year, even when tomatoes aren't. And Tomatoes are good some years, but not all years. Anyway, um, peppers, I seem to always be able to get good peppers. And this is, let's see, uh, Fresno, Habanero, uh, Yatsufisa, Jalapeno, Thai Bird, Serrano, and Cayenne um, in, various, uh, in various colors, green and red. So we're moving into the full-on summer vegetables. These are the things that you, um, that you probably think of most when you think of gardening in the summer. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, which are all relatives of one another. Squash, melons, cucumbers, and beans and corn. And we'll start with the, the reason that most, the gateway drug of gardening, that most people start gardening because of tomatoes. And that's how I got started gardening. My grandmother grew tomatoes and I started growing them in, in LA and then grow them here. And I grow a lot of tomatoes. I put in anywhere from a minimum of like 36 plants up to 50 or 60 plants. Um, and, and then process them in a lot of ways from drying to, to freezing, to canning, to uh, et cetera. So this is a new one, I, I, not a new, new to me, um, Lemon Boy. I had not grown Lemon Boy, really good. Really good tomato, really good flavor. I found it to be not especially productive, but a good good flavor. They like rich tomatoes are hogs for water, hogs for nitrogen. If you think about it, a tomato plant, a big tomato plant, is a lot of plant, and it produces in a short amount of time. So it's really going to demand a lot from the soil and from the water. Uh, so it likes rich soil, lots of water. Uh, you don't want to grow tomatoes in the same place year after year because pest and disease um, diseases can build up in that place and then you'll eventually see decline you know plants might be susceptible so rot it says crop rotation but just try and think about and plan on paper like last year i grew tomatoes here so this year i'm going to grow them there i'm going to follow the tomatoes with um, beans for instance which are legumes and will add nitrogen back to the soil and that kind of thing the tomato in this photo is tigerilla it's terrible and don't grow it it's awful Ugh. It's an awful tomato. Here's another one of those peat pots. I found this funny. Tomatoes, you can plant them very deep. So the way I plant tomatoes when they're, let's say, that high is you prune off all the leaves up to that point and dig a really deep hole and plant the tomato all the way. So there's this much tomato stem under the soil because it will throw adventitious roots everywhere along the stem and where there were nodes and stuff. Um, this to me indicates a watering problem 
So this is a peat pot down here on the right. And then all the roots on the tomato are much higher than that, meaning probably that I wasn't getting enough water down low to where this tomato would have more roots and be more vibrant way down in the surface, uh, below the surface of the soil, but a nice fat worm there, which seems, seems good. I, and people have all different ways of training tomatoes. I trellis mine on a T post and rebar to keep them up off the ground and kind of more or less train them like grapes. Other people put them in, there's lots of different ways to do it, but just the little cages you can buy are not usually suitable for a big tomato. Tomatoes are determinate, indeterminate. Determinate means uh, are the bush type, and it means that they are generally a compact form that set their fruit all at the same time. Um, and they tend to be the plum type tomatoes, Roma, Repreco. Uh, indeterminate tomatoes, which is what probably most tomatoes are, or most of the ones you see in, in the stores, are vining types. And they will just grow and grow, and they have uh, flowers and fruit in various stages of ripening at all times. Uh, here's the determinate tomato. So again, it's a bushy type and it has flowers all at once and it'll fruit all at once and ripen all at once. So this is probably Roma Repreco, which is a plum type tomato and really good for sauce because then you have a lot of tomatoes all at once in the same stage. Whereas this is an indeterminate. So you have flowers up top, you have green fruit, you have red fruit and uh, just a vining habit. Um, there's lots of things about tomatoes. You can choose them for their size, for their color, for their use. Um, there's a ruffled one. There's that tigerella. It's just a, not a very good tomato. It's weedy and it doesn't taste very good. Cherry tomatoes are a great way to, to get a lot of fruit in a small space. And if you really, and they tend to be sweet and uh, really delicious. Here's a, and come in, this is a yellow cherry or a yellow uh, pear type. Here's the pro, one of the main problems. And again, it, this is one where you just let it go. Like it's blossom and rot. It happens in my garden to every, the first flush of tomatoes from any plant the first few have this. It has to do with rapidly growing tissues and water transpiration and calcium. And you'll see folk remedies like spray them with milk and all that other stuff. None of those are, none of those bear out as, as reasonable solutions. And the, my plants just always grow out of this. After the first couple of fruits, they're like, oh, we figured it out. And so you can, if, if this is a consistent problem, you can try and add calcium to your soil. You can try a bunch of folk remedies, but as master gardeners, we only talk about um, UC researched solutions right and so this is a this is a difficult problem but again you just cut that part off and eat it anyway these kind of things right this is a, a, a hornworm on pepper but they'll go to pepper but they also go to tomatoes uh, this is a problem only because they're hard to see you can usually hear them if you go out in the garden in the morning quietly you can hear them chewing um, these are just a hand pick and destroy or hand pick and give to the stellar jays or uh, I read a thing where someone trained their uh, labs to sniff them out and eat them in the garden. So uh, you can train a dog to take care of this problem. Other kind of problems of tomatoes. Tomatoes, by the way, are super easy to grow. And so that's why a lot of people grow them. And it's why a lot of people can feel successful gardening because they're just really good plants and they're hardy and rugged. It late uh, rains at weird times will do that. You'll get cracking, right? If a bunch of rain happens like odd, odd uh, summer storms. The plants just take up too much water and they'll crack. You need to pick those and eat them uh, or they'll just rot and get, get awful. Um, and I grow, again, a lot of tomatoes. These are some ones that I grow that I have in rotation. Uh, most are, are heirloom varieties that have been grown for since time began. Um, Arkansas Travelers, classic. I don't have mortgage lifter on here, but I'd look into that one. Oaxacan pink, Oaxacan pink is a beautiful and tasty tomato, hard to process because it folds in on itself and it has a lot of sort of stems and folds. Um, bull's heart, nice big, looks like a bull's heart. For plum type tomatoes, I always grow Repreco and Amish Paste. Peace Fine Cherry is a good one. Black Cream is a beautiful and salty tomato that is sort of a, a purpley brown black, Martian Giant. The last two there, if you are in a small space, Kootenai and Red House Freestanding are small, stocky, self-supporting. They don't produce a lot, but they are a, a very small and manageable tomato to grow. And I saw this in a catalog. I've never tried it, but supposedly, because they are, they are in the same family, supposedly you can grow a, I don't remember which catalog, but uh, tomatoes on top, potatoes on the bottom. I'm, I'm interested, but it's a little gimmicky for me. And I would look at, if you're into this, tomatillos, which are uh, for salsa and other things. This is a purple land-raised tomatillo. 
they come in their own little husky wrapper. So uh, they're very weedy though. If you leave any of these in the garden, you'll get tomatillos for the next hundred years. Easy to eradicate, but they do produce a lot of seeds. And peppers are in our tomato adjacent. Um, peppers are sweet and or hot. And the sweet peppers aren't necessarily sweet per se, it just means they're not hot. So bell peppers are considered sweet peppers. Here's a bell pepper in my garden. The ones I grow, and you may have this experience as well, they don't have as thick a wall as commercially grown bell peppers. I can't, I, I've never found a variety or I don't have the conditions to make that happen. And so, but that's fine. They taste like a bell pepper. Uh, they're just not as meaty, I would say. Pepper seeds take a long time to germinate. And so um, you should be patient and um, they need warm temperatures. They like afternoon shade. They will always say it's full sun, but in fact, peppers will really suffer in our county in the full heat of the sun, especially in the heat of, in the dead of summer. So I always plant them to the lee or to the, to the afternoon shade side of tall tomatoes, right? So that by the time the sun is past 12 o'clock, the tomatoes are casting a little sun on the peppers. And I keep them together like that. And then I rotate that as a cluster. So my tomato and pepper clusters go around the garden and not in the same place every year. Mulch, right? They they have fleshier leaves than tomatoes and stuff, so they like uh, heavy mulch. And in in the windstorms that we always get, they're very brittle. And if they're full of peppers, they'll they'll either snap off or they'll fall over and keep growing. But they that those kind of flimsy tomato cages are actually pretty good for helping peppers stay upright uh, in the garden. There's just another another few of peppers. And they always are, are right, ready right when school starts. So I usually bring a bunch into the college and, and I have the Scoville scale, right? So people that like hot ones can take, uh, take certain ones. There's just a couple of pictures. Um, peppers, mo most of them start out green, but will go red and you can eat any pepper. And they, they I actually, a lot of them taste better when they're red. They get more of a tangy, um, tangy kind of aftertaste. Um, there's a nice yellow pepper. There's maybe Corny de Toro or something like it. There's an Anaheim, um, classic relleno pepper and other things, which turn red, right? So you can you can harvest them green or red. Um, and a lot of them it, uh, will dry as well, right? So this is a uh, this is cayenne, which starts out a little dry, but it, you can dry that and then grind it up as a as a red pepper. There's just a beautiful. It's funny, they start going red from the from the stem end. There's just a, that's probably a hot one. Little ones tend to be pretty hot. That's maybe a Thai bird or a Pekin or something. Um, more pepper. And look for some purple ones, right? This is a Bolivian variety that I can't remember the name of, but um, super ornamental. And then habanero, if you like those. They um, they take forever to ripen. They're not usually ripe until November. They're the last thing that comes out of the garden, but you don't need many, right? You just need, that's like a year's harvest from a plant and you can you can actually just sort of simmer that or bake that in oil at a low temperature for a long time and you get um, habanero oil that you can add to things. It's really great in a, in a cornbread. Here's just a couple of varieties you might consider. Um, they tend to be on the hot side. Anaheim's not hot. Um, Fresno can be, but is not especially hot. And then jalapeno and up tend to be kind of hot. Serrano's hotter than jalapenos, cayenne's hotter than those, habanero's hotter than most, than most. And then, you know, uh, if you get into peppers, you can get catalogs that are just like the, whatever, the scotch bonnets and buccalochias and just crazy hot peppers if you're into that sort of thing. Eggplant, another relative. I don't like it. I like to grow it for friends and family, but uh, I'm not a big fan, but I like to grow the smaller, um, this style, which is, um, it's a Japanese variety that I can't think of the name of, but um, VF, so verticillium and fusarium wilt. So you'll see on, on seed packets, those are some problems. So you want to you want to choose seeds or plants that are resistant to V and F. Tomato cages to prop them up. I plant only a few because I don't like them. Uh, you can start them indo indoors, but they're the last plant that goes out in the garden. They're really sensitive to, they'll really stunt and not do well if the soil isn't well warmed up. Um, but they come in, you know, there's white ones and skinny ones and the classic long ones. And then uh, flea beetles are the problem. They'll, that uh, diatomaceous 
this earth. So flea beetles get on them and then you can shake, you know, use this cake sifter or whatever to, um, to put diatomaceous earth on them and then that usually takes care of the problem. Squash, don't overplant. Squash is tremendously productive given most conditions. And so you don't need too many to get overwhelmed with squash. You need to, to make sure that this is why insects are good in your garden. Squash has male and female flowers and the, the bees move the pollen around. This is a plant, a large seeded plant that you direct seed and pick to keep it productive. So as these squash are coming up, you pick them and the plant will, because the plant, if you think about it, it wants to, its goal in life is to make, make these squashes and seeds for next season to, to live on, right? And so if it thinks it's done that, and then it sort of stops being productive. And, and you'll always get squash where, you know, the zucchini that is hiding and you'll find it and it's eight feet long and whatever, not a big deal. Just, you know, keep them picked to keep them productive. And of course they come in, you know, this is a yellow crookneck. Um, you can get zucchini types, which are um, typically green, but you can also get yellow zucchinis, which are straight yellows or patty pan like this, which are the UFO shaped. Uh, the blossoms are lovely batter fried as well. Um, just some varieties to try. Squash is just a really easy plant. One of the main problems with squash is powdery mildew usually happens late in the season. And it, by that time, you're usually sick of squash. And when that happens, I either just tear that one out and plant another one or just be done with squash by that time. Because um, there's not a lot you can do about powder, powdery mildew. You can you can try sulfur and some other things. But, but again, it's just by that time, I'm sick of squash. Usually happens late in the season in my garden. There's bees doing their work. Here's a, a curry, red curry squash. Beautiful, um, beautiful kind of red flesh. Pumpkins are fun to grow. Uh, these are two 96 and 102 pounds. I don't grow pumpkins competitively or anything, but once, once one year I tried to grow really big ones and those are the biggest that I got. Um, that requires, um, you know, one fruit per vine and a vine is whatever 15 feet long and it's a giant waste of space and but it's fun um and you know putting an umbrella over them so that the skin doesn't harden and it allows it to grow but anymore i grow snack jack and kakai hullus which are um they don't have a seed coat they're naked seeds and so you can just eat them like sunflower seeds uh here's a this is a kakai hullus um Sometimes they germinate inside their own shell, which is fun. But that's what the seeds look like. They don't have a hard seed coat. So you can just toast those up and, and just eat them right away. And they're really delicious and really good for you. Cantaloupes and melons. Again, bee pollinated. Um, these are warm weather fruits. So you usually direct seed these when it's warm. Or you can back up the season by starting them in a greenhouse to kind of get a good plant going because they can take a long time. Um, you can smell when a when a when a, a peck, particularly a cantaloupe is ready, um, and if you sort of slightly twist it, it'll um, it'll snap right off the vine. Watermelon is fun to grow, but takes a lot of space. This is a bush snakeskin variety, um, but if you wanted to try watermelon, I would go for small variety, sugar baby, a little sort of watermelons in that size. Um, Early moonbeam, yellow flesh watermelon, moon and stars. That's a dark green with a crimson, uh, cream colored splotches. Um, they take a long time. Th these are typically, you plant them in a hill with two or three seeds per hill, and then they grow and they take a lot of space. So um, consider whether watermelon, and, and fun to grow, but consider whether that you have the space for that. Cucumbers uh, don't like to be moved. So they don't like to be planted in, from six packs. They don't like their roots disturbed. So plant them, direct seed them. Um, train them up. I, you saw in some of the photos, that's one a plant where you can train it up so that it's up off the ground and the leaves aren't getting wet for some issues, um, you know, fungus and other diseases of the leaves. They don't, it says, I say avoid cool or shady locations, but if you can have the roots to be, roots cool and the tops hot, that's the best possible conditions in my experience for cucumbers. They, um, they really like consistent water. And if you forget to water or they don't get enough water, they're not mulched, they, they will either stop producing or they'll produce bitter kind of really bad cucumbers. So if you can somehow get the roots under the compost pile in the shade and the plants out in the sun, that's the best condition. Um, different varieties, long and short. 
for particular purposes, slicing or canning. Um, there's just a classic kind of, can, uh, you know, cucumber type uh, or pickle type cucumber. There's an Armenian long type. That one's probably too long. <laughs> uh, I let that one go uh, and thus fed it to the chickens. And this last year, there's another new thing I grew. If you can try it there, sometimes you'll, you'll see them cu cucumelons, but Mexican sour gherkins. They're little, they're like your, the size of your thumb. And inc or where's the camera? And incredibly prolific. This took over like all the beds and made a billion of these. They're fun to pickle, um, lacto ferment or pickle, because they they're like a little watermelon and um, they're a little bit sour and they make a pretty good pickle. So try that. And then beans. Beans are the warm season legume. Beans you want to plant after danger of frost. So beans you're really not planting um, until when are we planting beans? Well, when it's warm you know, April, May, and on into, on into the season, you can keep planting them, or May, June. But um, so do moisture. So especially if the soil is a little bit cold, you don't want them to rot. So what you do is you wet the soil deeply, and then you plant the beans. And I always um, pre-soak them for 24 hours in just warm water. And then you plant the bean, and then you don't water until they've germinated, as in this photo. And, and sort of come up. And that way you avoid having them rot in the soil. You can plant some now, plant some in two weeks, plant some in two weeks, and you get uh, extended harvest. Pole types and bush types, look for those. Some of the same varieties are, are available in pole and bush types. Pole types um, require some kind of trellising. They're big, vigorous plants. Bush types produce less overall, but are more manageable. Uh, pests and disease, and here's some scarlet runner beans. Um, we were talking about that before the presentation, which are a flat potted um, bean. Spider mites is really the big one for, and I didn't mention that for tomato, but it's true for them and beans in my garden. Spider mites um, will get and they'll silver the leaves and they'll, they'll, they'll infest a plant. And really the best way to deal with that for tomatoes, I keep the, I prune all the foliage above kind of 12 inches um, to give fewer vectors for insects to get in. Uh, insecticidal soap, picking the leaves and destroying them. Um, and so spider mites are something you kind of have to keep on because they'll get to your, get to beans in particular. And finally, corn, there's a puppy in the corn. Um, corn is one, it takes a lot, you know, it makes me sad. People buy a six pack and plant six corns in a row. C corn really wants to be in blocks that are like seven feet by seven feet or five feet by five feet at a minimum because it's wind pollinated. Um, but it's fun to grow and it's delicious, right? Big water, big feeder, lots of water required. Um, you can plant, look for the words early, mid, and late so that you have an extended corn harvest. Pick it and boil it as soon as possible so that you get the sugariest part. And look for, you know, depending on your tolerance, you can look for old fashioned varieties like Silver Queen and any more, you know, corn is marketed as the sweetest thing in the world. So, um, Look for sugary enhanced or super sweet varieties if you're if you're uh, into that. And then lastly, and we're running out of time, so I'll just briefly mention that perennials are. Uh, we mention them now because you're going to be buying them now. Usually, perennials, um, as opposed to annuals, are plants you plant and then they come back year after year, or they just stay alive uh, around the clock. Typically, for these, they're coming back, dying to the ground and coming back. You want to have a really good soil because these plants are going to be in place for. 15 or 20 years, or a minimum of like five years and then you move them or whatever. So you really wanna have some phosphorus, you wanna have a rich deep soil and you want it to be out of the way so you're not disturbing the roots. Um, you'll find right now or soon, you'll find artichokes, either bare root as kind of nuggets, in that bare root meaning they'll be in like a box of whatever, sawdust or sand, um, or sometimes you find them in pots. I don't, I'm not very good at growing artichokes, but I know that some gardeners in Lotus and other folks that I know in the county have real good success. So I keep trying. Um, it's just a thistle, right? It's a thistle that you that is uh, particularly selective for the fleshy bottoms of those sepals, I guess they are. Um, I grow cardoon, which is much easier to grow when you grow that for the stalk. And it basically, it's like celery that tastes like, it's an artichoke, but it, it tastes, it's like a celery that you eat the stalks and they taste like artichoke. Um, and then rhubarb, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, but rhubarb is a perennial that um, 
that you put in the ground and it grows every year. And then you take say a third of those stalks um, off of the plant in any one picking. And for all perennials, you got to leave something for the plant to renew itself and go into the next year. So you never want to just pick these all out. They'll, they'll run out of energy, right? And they won't, they'll eventually decline over time. Uh, and asparagus is like that. So asparagus you plant and then you're really not picking it for real until the third year and the fourth year and then every subsequent year. You can start asparagus from seeds, but you typically buy it in, um, in this format, which is the crown, right? It looks like a little octopus or something, well, maybe more than octo, but you plant it in a trench. You can see snow on the ground there. So you'll see these at bare root time. And then you cover that asparagus just barely and it'll start to grow. And as it grows, you keep covering it, keep covering it so that the, the crown and the root system is down, you know, 12, 16, 18 inches in the soil. And then in, in you, you, the first year you just let it grow and it dies down. And then the second year you might be able to harvest a few and then, but you can't take much. And the third year you can pick it a little bit. And then the fourth year it's on its roots, it's, it's established and then you can continue to harvest. So it's always so, sold with these heroic male names like Jersey Knight and Jersey King because you want to grow male asparagus because female asparagus makes berries and you don't want the plant quote unquote, wasting its time. You want the stalks, right? You don't want it spending any energy making fruit. And so um, there's the a female, but anytime I planted asparagus, even buying in crowns, I always get female plants anyway, and it's not a big deal. Um, uh, the female plants have these berries that'll go red and the males just have little flowers. So it gets big, six, and, six feet high, seven feet high, lovely foliage. You can see this female plant in lovely golden foliage with, um, with red berries. It can be weedy actually and grows, uh, but really drought tolerant once established. And, um, and it's a good plant to plant. Just know that you're going to, it's going to take a while for you to, to eat it. So that's it. That's, that's the spring and summer vegetables and what you need to know to, um, to grow them. What we find out as master gardeners when we go through the training is that none of us knows everything and we're better all together. And so the resources that I constantly use are the Master Gardener website, and we'll probably either find a way to put these in the chat or they'll be in this presentation. The UC IPM website, which is Integrated Pest Management. So if you have a particular problem in your garden, you can go there and, and, and find all the solutions for ground squirrels or for earwigs or whatever the, whatever the problem you seem to be having. The VRIC um, vegetable resource research information, they have great one sheet things about tomatoes for the home garden or watermelons for the home garden and kind of a rundown of all the best cultural and gardening practices to, uh, to grow the best things. We have plant a row for the hungry in our county. So I hope you're very successful and that you can look up um, food closets and soup kitchens that can take fresh produce. And uh, you can look at my uh, food forest project at foodforestgarden.org. Again, this is not, it's non-commercial. It's just a labor of love. Um, and though it hasn't been updated in a while, there's a lot, a couple, many, I've been working on the project since 2012. So there's a lot of uh, information there. And I thank you for your time and attention. I thank my fellow master gardeners and hosts, and I look forward to um, hearing about your gardens. And I hope you have a successful gardening year. Great. Uh, thank you, Zach. Um, getting lots of 